And we're back. Welcome back and happy Tuesday. Today we'll continue on in our discussion about the feasibility of learning and we will connect Herfting's inequality with something that looks a lot more like learning by searching through a hypothesis step. But before we do so, some administrative bits. The reading, chapter 1 through section 1.3 in the main text, Learning from Data. So where we last left off, we talked about Herfting's inequality, and it derived from the weak law of large numbers and expressed a bound on the probability of an, a bad thing happening, a bad event happening. And that bad event was the coincidence between new, the in-sample proportion of red marbles, and mu, the out-of-sample proportion of red marbles inside of a bin. And we said this probability that nu diverges from mu by more than some tolerance epsilon, that probability is at most 2e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n. And we said that this expressed a trade-off between the number of samples you take, sample size, and the error tolerance epsilon. And you effectively have to pay for very, very tight tolerance, a very small epsilon, by having more samples. And with this, we're taking something that we know, nu, and we're using its proximity to something we don't know, mu, even though nu is dependent on mu, we're treating it as if mu is dependent on nu. And what this Herfting's inequality says as long as we maintain the quote-unquote right balance between our tolerance epsilon and the number of samples or sample size, then even though we don't know what mu is, we know that it will be close enough within our tolerance. Most of the time, small probability, it will be close enough without knowing what mu is. It will be close enough to nu. All right. So... We use this inequality to show how nu affects mu, but the actual case is the other way around. So let's take a look at what happens in a certain scenario where we extend Herfting's inequality, and we do this to try to connect it more directly to a learning scenario. And we consider multiple hypotheses. So we're going to introduce a little bit more machinery, which is going to provide us this idea of a linkage uh, between this marbles in the bin and learning that we talked about when we went over the components in the anatomy of a learner. So the bin is going to represent our input space. And we said at the outset that we have a set of vectors these vectors x are drawn from the space of d-dimensional real value features. And so our entire input space, each little x, we call that big X. And this big X, of course, is our subset of R super D. So let's define a probability distribution over our input space. And this probability distribution is going to give us the values associated with each one of our feature vectors describing one of our data points. And so each marble inside of the bin, or urn, is going to represent one of our input vectors. The values of these input vectors are then governed by the probability distribution. Now, of course, we didn't specify what the form is for that probability distribution. It could be anything. It's floating out there assigning values to the marbles. So the bin, as we said, has some unknown associated value mu. We don't know what it is. The target function, we said, is unknown. We don't know what it is, but it's sitting off there in the background, merrily assigning labels, y, to inputs from our input space, feature vectors, x, our data points. So our marble will stand as a data point, a sample or instance, and the color of the marble describes the coincidence between a particular hypothesis, 
from our hypothesis set, our working hypothesis, and our unknown target function. And so the marble represents the data point, but the color of a marble, if it's green, corresponds to the hypothesis H of X coinciding with its labeling, coinciding with that of the ground truth target function on that point. And so if H of X is equal to F of X, we say that color is green. And if the hypothesis does not agree with the labeling by the ground truth target function on the input, we color it red. And so now we use the color to represent the coincidence in labeling between the hypothesis, a particular H, and the unknown target function. So going back to the anatomy of a learner, we have our probability over the input space, X, governing all the feature values we see among our training data. And you don't have control over this probability distribution. It's floating out there doing its thing. But this probability will give us some of the pieces we need to link Hurfting's inequality more general to something that looks like learning. So we use the probability to generate data independently, and there are no assumptions on this probability, but absolutely this probability is going to affect mu, the proportion of red marbles. Because based on the features instantiation for these inputs, that's going to result in a certain output of the unknown target function, which might coincide or not coincide with a given hypothesis. So we have a very specific hypothesis, H, single hypothesis. And this single hypothesis, when you compare it label output by this hypothesis with that of the unknown target function, that's going to result in a particular coloring of red data points and green data points, i.e. the disagreement and the agreement with this unknown target function. So given a single H, a specific H, you can draw marbles from the bin and with enough samples, a sample size big enough, some sample size then, then our in-sample proportion of red marbles, new, becomes a very good stand-in for mu. Now, of course, we just talked about that. Hurfting's inequality tells us so. But this is for a specific hypothesis. Now, this idea of looking at the coincidence between a hypothesis, a single one, and our unknown target function, this is not learning. This is a verification of that particular H. Now, it's called verification because it says, aha, it agreed well with the unknown target function. This tells you if this H or good or bad, if it agrees or disagrees with the unknown target function on the data, where agreement means green and disagreement with the unknown target function means red. So in this case, this is not the same as searching through our hypothesis set. In the anatomy of a learner, we said the learning algorithm's role is to search through the space of hypotheses for that working hypothesis, little h, that most closely coincides after a series of rounds with the labeling through the action of the unknown target function. We call that result our final best hypothesis, G. But here, we're not searching. You're not finding some H. You're just answering the question, does H match the action of the unknown target function? Does it match the labeling of the unknown target function? So we have a specific coloring of marbles based on that little h drawn from our script big H, our hypothesis set. Now, you could pick a lot of samples, make n the sample size big enough to show that your hypothesis little h works well, it coincides well. And then, of course, you might find that it performs horribly when you select new marbles, not part of that sample, from the bin. Absolutely, that can happen. But in the case of learning, what makes it learning is the searching for that best H from among multiple hypotheses that we collected together and describing as our hypothesis set script H. So let's model this 
with multiple bins, and we're going to have different hypotheses, H1 for the first hypothesis, H2 for the second hypothesis, and H3, up to and including some H big M for some value of big M. So we have big M many hypotheses. And then we're going to sample N, same N, some number of these marbles from the bin. And the first bin has a mu describing the proportion of red marbles for that hypothesis. And when you draw that sample, you calculate the red proportion of marbles, nu, for that first hypothesis. So corresponding to H1, we have a mu1 for the bin, and we have a new one associated with the proportion of red marbles for the sample. Now, of course, in truth, we don't know what the mu's are. That has not changed. But what has changed is that we're drawing that sample m many times for each of big M many hypotheses. So we go to H2, and we do similarly. We have mu2 associated with the bin, and we have nu2, which is calculated the proportion of the red marbles for that sample size n. So we do that again and again and again for a third hypothesis, fourth hypothesis, etc., up to including HM. Now, this looks a lot more like learning. Essentially, we're sampling looking for a good sample, and we're trying to use those samples to find a good hypothesis. So some hypotheses will work really well, and others do not. So if you look at hypothesis H1, well, hmm, well, the sample that looks very similar to the proportions for mu1, for mu1, and you see more red, they disagree, whereas with hypothesis H2, there's much more agreement. And if you look at the proportion expressed by mu2 and nu2, well, they look kind of roughly similar. They're mostly green. So some hypotheses will perform well, others might not. For example, in this case, the target function f, this marble in the upper right-hand part of the urn, or the bin, that's red, so it means H1 disagrees with the target function on that value. But for that same value, H2 agrees with the target function on the same datum. So you're sampling from this bin. You have the same set of features, but you're drawing samples, and because you're drawing samples, these points you sample might be different, but you're sampling again and again and again while searching for a good hypothesis. So the bin frequency, mu, certainly depends on the choice of hypothesis. The sample frequency mu, the nu, the sample frequency nu also depends on the choice of hypothesis. So let's change the notation here, and we're going to connect it specifically to the hypothesis. It is dependent on the hypothesis. For a different hypothesis, as we saw in the previous slide, well, they might be different in terms of their agreement with the unknown target function for the same vector instantiation for the data point. And so that being the case, the coloring of the balls, both for those marbles or balls in the bin and those that you've sampled, the coloring is going to be dependent on the particular hypothesis. So we're going to look at this coincidence as error, which it is. It's the coincidence of the hypothesis with the unknown target function. And we're going to look at those coincidences for the balls that are outside of the bin. And so since these are the inputs or the data points or the vectors outside of the bin, we call this in-sample error. And it's called in-sample error because <coughs> it's the error within the sample. And so we call the coincidence for the sampled marbles the in-sample error. And we index that 
we parameterize that with the hypothesis because it's dependent on the hypothesis. In similar fashion, when we talk about the error associated with the marbles in the bin, well, those exist outside of the sample. They haven't been sampled. You haven't seen them. So the coincidence for those balls outside of the sample, we call that error E out, out of sample error. We parameterize that with a hypothesis because it's dependent on the hypothesis. So we have E out of H for those marbles or balls that are outside of the sample. Outside of the sample means inside of the bin. And then we have E in of H. The in sample error is the coincidence with the unknown target function for that hypothesis for those points that were sampled. So in sample, new has error, we're going to call it E in of H. And out of sample, mu has the error E out of H. And so this is the error associated with approximating the target function for a hypothesis, a given hypothesis. And so we go back to Herfding's inequality, and now we replace nu and mu with our expressions for error, tying this to the learning problem. And so we do this, and now instead of the probability that nu minus mu exceeds tolerance epsilon, we write the probability that E in of H minus E out of H exceeds that tolerance. The right-hand side of the inequality has not changed. That's our bound on the probability that expresses the relationship between the error tolerance and the sample size. But now when we look at this, we're looking at the probability that in-sample error diverges from out-of-sample error by more than the error tolerance. So we're not done yet because this still is not learning. We need these multiple bins. And for these multiple bins, we rewrite it in terms of in-sample and out-of-sample error. So where we had new associated with the coincidence for the in-sample points, we write E in for each hypothesis. And then where we had mu associated with the coincidence or the error for the out-of-sample points that lie within the bin, we write E out for that hypothesis. So we have E in for H1, E out for H1, E in for H2, E out for H2, so forth, up to and including E in for HM, and E out for HM. Okay. So now, when we look at this, Herfding's inequality doesn't really work for multiple bins. And the reason has to do with the fact that you're trying again and again and again and again. And this is illustrated in the book with an example. And let's suppose now you flip a fair coin and say you get three heads. What exactly does this mean if you get three heads after flipping a fair coin three times? Is the probability of the coin being heads one? No. You just happen to have a pathological case that just came up. Now, remember that we said new, the in-sample proportion or coincidence, implies mu. So let's look at what happens if we toss a fair coin 10 times. Now, we have more tosses, and if we wanted to know if this holds true, that the probability of heads is 1, well, we toss the fair coin 10 times, and we look at the probability of having 10 heads. Now, if we work out the math, that's 0.001, and that's very, very small. So this idea of this heads coming up on every outcome is a very infrequent occurrence. But let's change this experiment. Let's say you had 1,000 fair coins, and you're going to take these fair coins and toss each one 10 times. Now, if this is like having a 1,000 bins, and the 10 times tossing is like sampling 10 times. And so if in this experiment 
you wanted to compute the probability that one of the 1,000 fair coins is going to have 10 heads when you toss each one 10 times, that probability increases dramatically, 63%, 0.63. And this just says if you do something often enough, like sample from a bin with different hypotheses, it's likely that the pathological case will happen, something bad will happen. So let's look at this figuratively. Let's assume the probability of heads is mu, and we're going to generate a sample for the first hypothesis, generate a sample for the second, for the third, the fourth, the fifth, up to including M, and let's say M is really, really large. It's very likely that when we sample, we might get that pathological case where all of our samples just happen to be green marbles. Now, can that happen? Absolutely. But if we do this experiment enough times, if M is big enough, it's very likely that that case is going to happen. But if you look at this, this sample has all green points, and that is wildly off from what is the case, ground truth, for the out-of-sample points. And so eventually, if you try hard enough, you'll find the perfect hypothesis. You declare victory, then you try to use it in practice. You get some point from the out-of-sample, and your system performs miserably. So we need to augment Harfting's inequality to better handle this case of where we have the multiple bits. So you have to deal with it properly. Herfting's inequality falls apart in the case we have multiple bins, but it works fine with a single bin. So let's explore this. So this idea of in-sample error diverging from out-of-sample error by more than error tolerance epsilon, that is an event that is a bad thing that happens. It's a bad event. And so, in essence, when we find our final best hypothesis in the anatomy of a learner, that final best hypothesis is the result of looking at the divergence between the in-sample and the out-of-sample performance, whether it exceeds that threshold epsilon. So you do that for the first hypothesis. You do that for the second hypothesis. You do it for the third hypothesis you do it up to and including the nth hypothesis. Now, of course, if we're thinking of this as an event and we're looking at the probability associated with that event, we're going to pick the best one. And so from a Venn diagram standpoint, well, what's the worst case that can happen? Well, the probability of this best, final best hypothesis, the in-sample error for it exceeding the out-of-sample error diverging by more than tolerance epsilon would correspond to these individual events for hypothesis 1, hypothesis 2, hypothesis M would be non-overlapping in Venn diagram. And so if we look at the right-hand side, we arrive upon this final best hypothesis by evaluating a single hypothesis. So each one of these is a single hypothesis. And for the single hypothesis case, Herfting's inequality works well. So we're looking for the case of, is it the first one that's bad, or the second one, or the third one, or the nth one? And so if they do not overlap in the Venn diagram, that is the worst case for the upper bound of this probability. Why? Because if they do not overlap, well, if they don't overlap, the probability is associated with the sum of the probabilities of all these bad things happening. But if they do overlap, well, we have to subtract out where they overlap because we'd be double counting them. And that would tend to make the probability associated with the final best hypothesis smaller. And so what we can do is we take this bound and we add up the probability associated with the divergence between in-sample error and out-of-sample error, those probabilities associated with the first hypothesis, add it with that probability of bad event for the second, the third, the fourth, up to and including 
the nth, h sub m. And so if we do this, well, we just add them up and we get the sum for little m goes from 1 to big M for the probability that E in for the nth hypothesis in sample error for the nth hypothesis diverges from out of sample error for the nth hypothesis by more than error tolerance epsilon. And now because these are individual hypotheses, H sub M, we can substitute in Hurfting's inequality for each one of them and find a closed solution. So let's do this. If we substitute for the terms inside of our sum on the right-hand side of this inequality, well, we substitute in what that was for Hurfting's inequality. That was 2e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n. And so we get the sum for m goes from 1 to big M of 2e to the minus 2 epsilon squared n. So therefore, our result for the probability that E in for a final best hypothesis diverges from E out for a final best hypothesis exceeding tolerance epsilon is at most 2 times big M E to the minus 2 epsilon squared F. Now, this big M, that's the size of the hypothesis set script H. If the hypothesis set is relatively small, okay, well, for a given error tolerance, you don't need as many input samples for the sample size. But if our hypothesis set is really big, it's very complex, then you're going to need a lot of samples to pay for that complexity. So the probability that in-sample error is within tolerance of out-of-sample error is bounded by this expression. The good news is that it has an exponential term. If you have too many hypotheses, meaning your hypothesis set is too complex, well, you have an increased probability. It becomes more and more likely that you're going to exceed the error tolerance. And the only way to pay for that is with a large sample size. You want the right-hand side to be as small as possible. And so a sophisticated model has a big hypothesis set, so M is big, a sophisticated model essentially memorizes the sample and does not generalize well, does not approximate well out of sample. And this plays out with this so-called union bound. You're taking the union of non-overlapping bad events motivated by the Venn diagram, and you're coming up with an expression that expresses the worst case associated with your final best hypothesis achieved by search. So you want the right-hand side to remain small, and a more sophisticated model does not perform well out of sample. The in-sample error will diverge from the out-of-sample error. So in order for in-sample to track well or coincide with out-of-sample, larger sophistication loses track. This probability increases. The only way you can pay for that is by having more resources. The resources aren't sufficient if this hypothesis set gets too big, or your error tolerance is too strict. You have to make epsilon bigger and loosen up the coincidence between in-sample and out-of-sample performance. And so this union bound gives us an expression that connects Herfting's inequality for the single hypothesis case to learning because you're now incorporating this idea of search through the space of hypotheses. But this search doesn't come for free. You pay for it with the complexity or sophistication of the hypothesis set. The bigger the hypothesis set, the more likely your out-of-sample performance is going to diverge from your in-sample performance by violating or more than that error threshold. So you either have to loosen up your error threshold or increase the number of examples or make your hypothesis set less complex. Okay, so with that, we'll end there and we will pick back up on Thursday as usual. Please stay healthy, uh, stay safe. COVID is no joke at all. So I will see you all on Thursday.